Good morning. So uh, I'm not Gloria. I'm Michael. <laughs> Gary's at the other end, and uh, you know, uh, this was this is billed as a fireside chat, right? So where's the fire? <laughs> We have to bring it. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, but I hope this is going to be really a conversation rather than presentation lecture. Now, we will default into that if, uh, if required, but I'm going to try to push for conversation amongst us and then to engage all of you as well. Uh, I'll throw out and so we have these three key pillars of this conversation will be race, reform, and rights, the other three R's. And I want to begin with um, a sort of historical reference and, and that, you know, we are in an historical moment when uh, we are reconsidering and reflecting on uh, seminal and iconic moments in American history. This is either the 150th anniversary of something very important around the subject of race, or it is the 50th anniversary, the 150th anniversary this year of the Emancipation Proclamation, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. I won't quote Lincoln and I won't quote King, but I will quote Frederick Douglass, the great black abolitionist, runaway slave, uh, who said in his first of several autobiographies, education is the pathway from slavery to freedom. So I'd ask both Gary and Gloria to reflect on where the great-great-grandchildren of those slaves are today on the pathway. And whether race is still a barrier, an obstacle <coughs> along that path from slavery to freedom. Gary? It's a long path, and it's really more of an escalator than a path, because you have to get further along now to be in the same place that, uh, that you were a generation ago. Um, when Brown was decided, less than a, a, a fourth of black students in the country were graduating from high school. Um, obviously, we've made big gains in that respect. Um, when Lyndon Johnson came to office, there was no college scholarship program at the federal level. We made big gains in that respect. When we, th in 19 states, there were legally separate higher education institutions for African American students. Um, in the middle 1960s, when President Kennedy sent the Civil Rights Bill to Congress in 1963, 99% of black students in the South were still in segregated schools. Um, the South was defying Brown straight out. We had a revolution in the middle 1960s with the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, and the Johnson administration's commitment of very powerful political resources to actually changing things. And the truth is that the South changed. Apartheid was ended by apartheid by law. There still exists in some ways. Um, education um, expanded. There was actually a brief period in the middle 1970s when African American and Latino students who went survived high school were equally likely to go to college. Um, at that point, we were expanding college opportunity, we were expanding financial aid, and we were expanding affirmative action. That was a brief period, and it hit that, and the, of course, we expanded federal aid to education with the first national big pro program in Title I in 1965. We created, under the poverty program, work study, upward bound, many important things, Head Start. We had a 
tidal wave of innovation and concern, and the March on Washington was called the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. There was a tremendous amount of economic mobility that happened during that period. Um, we then hit the, the Reagan era, in which all of those things were reversed in important ways. We cut back on funding. We transformed the Supreme Court to become an enemy of civil rights by the end of the Reagan and Bush years. Um, we went backwards on, on no civil rights enforcement was done, really. And there was this preposterous notion put forward by the Reagan administration that it was just as bad to work consciously for integration as it was to work for segregation. You should just pretend that race didn't even exist. Well, they have five votes on the Supreme Court who've been implementing that policy, like policy of colorblindness. Gaps opened, segregation revived. In the middle 1990s, the Supreme Court said um, desegregation is temporary, just a temporary punishment. You can go back to segregated neighborhood schools. Almost all of our big cities under court orders, except some of the very courageous and creative ones like Louisville is in the house, right? <laughs> um, they've gone backwards. Our magnet schools have resegregated. We've created a gigantic system of extremely segregated charter schools with no civil rights policies attached to them. We're in a bad situation. Access to college, which right now we have to think about education not just as K to 12, but as P to 16. Because preschool is very important, good preschool, and college is necessary. You can't be in the middle class unless you have post-secondary education now. We're creating a lot of barriers to college, financial barriers. We're not keeping our aid programs high enough to make up for those barriers. We're not building enough colleges. We're having more and more selective admissions. We got a lot of problems. We were looking at data in California last week, and we looked at who's in the top 10% of schools in our state, because we have an extremely competitive admissions to the University of California and even to the California State University system. And the top decile of schools um, are half of the Asian students in our state, one quarter of the black student, of the white students, 4% of the black students, and 3% of the Latino students. If you look at the other end, locked in the doubly segregated or triply segregated schools, which are segregated by poverty and race and sometimes language, that's where kids are who have virtually no chance of being ready for college. And we accept that segregation and do nothing about it. In fact, the major court orders in California have now been dissolved. Um, and think that we can make everything equal just by putting pressure on those schools where all those kids with problems are concentrated and where we have all the newest teachers who have the least experience. That's nonsensical. We, have, we, can, we construct this colorblind discussion that just say, it's your will. All you need to do is wish hard. And that if you, if you say that it's hard and you say it's unfair and you say the structure is um, racist in important ways, then they say you're making excuses. You know, that's not an excuse. That's the nature of the society. We have to face up to it. Colorblind solutions in a color polarized country don't work. And we have to make that message very clear to people. And we have to make clear to people what our objective is, which is to have schools that are diverse and fair and really lead to something. Um, and to make all the changes that are necessary for that to happen. Sorry, talk too long. No. <laughs> So Gloria, either building on or moving in a somewhat different direction, does race still matter? Oh, it definitely matters. And I want to build on some of the things that Gary has said. Um, I think even more pernicious than, than the, the Reagan uh, is if you go back and look at the stuff that Nixon did. Yes. Um, you know, we have documentation where Nixon tells his attorney general start filing cases to roll back Brown and keep filing until we get a reversal. So you see the, the chipping away uh, Milliken and, and, and the San Antonio cases. So 
Uh, Brown is. And Nixon tells his chief of staff that it doesn't matter because African Americans are incapable of, of learning. Right. So we, we, we have this overall structure that basically is said this group of people is not entitled to participate fully in the society. And one of the ways in which we ensure that is we make sure they don't have education. And that's been our history. It was literally illegal for us to learn to read. But then we turn around in the 90s and have people say, oh, black kids don't want to learn. They call learning acting white. Well, actually, they didn't start saying that. From their beginning, they were told whenever they learn, who do you think you are? Do you think you're white? So um, it, it's, a, it's an odd turning on its head. The other thing I think is important that I'm sure all of you are saturated with this notion of the achievement gap. And I have been arguing and arguing uh, for the last six or seven years that what we have is an education debt. Um, Kevin Wellner is here. Uh, he and Prudence Carter uh, just published a book which I contributed to called Closing the Opportunity Gap. So if you go back and look at the legislation around education from Goals 2000, Plan 2000, NCLB, there's one moment in the Clinton administration where they add another standard. And that standard was called the Opportunity to Learn Standard. In other words, you cannot hold people accountable for things that they don't have an opportunity to learn. Guess which standard fell off the table? So we've, we've had this situation in which um, Historically, we have not allowed African Americans and Latino students to participate fully uh, in education. And I know you don't want me to do a slide, but I need to show a, a picture. You're in control. OK. So if you would just show um, the second, that, well, that's the book. Go on. That one. So you can see here what uh, high school graduation looks like for African-American males. And those um, cities with the double circle, some of which are represented here, you know, Milwaukee, right, have, are among the lowest performing um, large districts for black males. So when we get up on the other end and say, oh, why don't we have more black teachers? Well. It's pretty hard to be a teacher if you don't graduate from high school, I, you know. <laughs> and so I think, you know, Gary talked about the, the, the entire P-16 um, pipeline. Uh, I'm actually looking at some data right now on what's happening at the college level. The 468 top tier universities in this country are largely white and Asian. The 3,250 two-year, four-year lower tiers schools are black and Latino. They are overcrowded, they are under-resourced, and you are less likely to graduate from one of these. You're more likely to have to work while you're doing it. Um, and so the system is unequal all the way through. Add to that the issue that the economy has changed immensely. When I came out of high school, I would say, and I went to a good high school in Philadelphia, I would say about half of us went on to four-year colleges. Another segment of us went into the armed services, which was a, at that time a good deal. And then another segment went straight to the workforce into good paying jobs with which they could raise families, buy homes, and live quality lives. That no longer exists. So the post-secondary experience is mandatory, and yet the kind of post-secondary experience that you are um, likely to receive is really racially determined. One of the things that we've been looking at since we submitted a brief to the Supreme Court in the, in the Texas case um, was um, the probability of students going to selective colleges and universities, because that's what affirmative action is about. 
Black students who graduate from high school have one-fifth the chance of going to a selective university than white students do. Uh, Latino students have one-third the chance. Um, you know, this is with affirmative action, and affirmative action, of course, is under threat. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're, we're falling behind badly. Many, many colleges are no longer need-blind in admissions, and truthfully, um, the Pell Grant's frozen. Um, it's going to be a larger and larger financial gap every year. And if you look at families now, after the Great Recession, the average black family had one nineteenth the in, the wealth of the average white family. It had one sixteenth. The Latino family had one sixteenth the wealth. A third of black and Latino families have no net worth. How are they going to provide resources for college? We have to think about supporting kids. We have to think about having a path to college that actually works, both in terms of preparing students and in terms of of uh, making it possible, making it financially possible for them to go. Uh, because we, we're really going in the wrong direction on these issues. We have a level of education that is as necessary today to be in the middle class as high school was at the time of Brown. And it's not accessible, um, you know, without uh, families being able to make substantial contributions, and many families can't. That's immoral, I think. They have a le le level of education that you have to have to have a chance for the middle class that you can't possibly afford if your family just doesn't have resources. So a, a high-performing, low-income student of color has about a 1 in 10 chance of going to and completing college, and a moderate-performing, high-income student not of color has about a 90% chance. So that might suggest that race still matters. And it's, so I, I want to I probe this a little bit more. Um, you both have referenced the role of presidential leadership or the lack thereof. Uh, in the case of Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon, and as a native Californian, I don't know why you're just picking on Californians. <laughs> but You know, one of the things that I say is both of the two worst presidents on civil rights come from the suburbs of Los Angeles. And all of Southern California is now 75 percent non-white in terms of its public school enrollment. Um, they have fouled their own nest. <laughs> well, as, a, as someone who grew up in the Los Angeles public schools and was educated there in the 1950s and the 1960s, I will tell you that uh, their uh, tracking of students of color and setting very almost impossible barriers to prepare for college, uh, you know, is a rich tradition uh, in Southern California. And it, it affected generations of black and brown students who, you know, were, didn't have the opportunity. I, I tell people that uh, I went to college at the age of 16 from LA High without graduating because my parents and grandparents forced the issue made sure I got into the college prep track. But I can tell you, and I took gardening, uh, print shop, uh, you know, all of the manual arts, because that was the expectation. And the school I was supposed to go to was manual arts. And I knew that that was not going to get me into college. Uh, what about, so presidential leadership matters. Uh, how do you think, how do you rank the leadership of this president in terms of addressing conditions of race and public education? You know, I'm a big supporter of President Obama. I was out knocking doors in, in Las Vegas <laughs> before the election. Uh, 
compared to the alternative, <laughs> it's wonderful to have <laughs> Barack Obama and, uh, down there a few blocks from here. But the education record has been very mixed and really disappointing to a lot of people who study schools. Um, where it was pretty good was that he, in the beginning, he put a lot of money into college scholarships. I thought that was a very important move. Um, he he yeah. put a, quite a bit of money into community colleges. Um, now, that, they're losing that in the agreements that they're making in order to keep the co country from going bankrupt with the idiots who are running the House of Representatives. Um, <laughs> But his policy towards elementary and secondary education has been really, really disappointing to me and the appointments that he's made. Um, many of us were hoping that the, the person who ran his transition team, Linda Darling-Hammond, was going to become Secretary of Education, which would have been a tremendous boost for the country. The Democratic president, since the Education Department was created have never named an educator as Secretary of Education. They, they named a judge under Carter, a former governor under Clinton, and uh, a manager uh, who managed the Chicago Public Schools for City Hall in Chicago. Uh, we need a serious educator who actually thinks about these issues running the education department. <laughs> um, but I think many of us think we've got basically the, the Gates Foundation, Broad Foundation agenda with Teach for America um, on the sidelines as, as the other major source. And we're, we're, we're getting rid of No Child Left Behind because its absurdity has been manifest to everyone. As was predicted before it was enacted, every state in the country would be now officially declared as a failure. So they have to get out of it, so they're negotiating these chaotic waivers. And the waivers are requiring a new stupidity, I think, which is, <laughs> um, you know, an inappropriate, unproved method of evaluating teachers as part of the deal to get out of the waivers. Now, I would have liked to have seen uh, some serious work on issues of race and e equality. There's a coalition of 20 civil rights organizations and civil rights research centers that constantly go to the education department and ask for help in supporting diverse communities in, in creating some preference under these waivers um, for good, more good public magnet schools instead of charter schools without any civil rights provisions. And on and on, we have had a very disappointing response from the Obama administration. Now, it is true in the Justice Department and the Office for Civil Rights, we have much better people. And they really know what should be done. But there really isn't any central leadership from the White House on these issues. Um, and now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, and they are not doing the evil things that were being done under the Bush administration. But it's much less than we could hope for. Gloria? You know, I would concur with Gary and being one of those people out knocking on doors. I sat on the education panel, state panel uh, in Wisconsin for the campaign, the 2008 campaign. Um, but it's not unpredictable. If you look at the context in which uh, the president came into office in 2008, economy in free fall, two wars, and his central agenda being health care. Education was not on the radar. And so it gets farmed out to someone he trusts, but doesn't actually know what he's talking about. Right? Uh, I'm really frustrated with Chicago always being held up, both in the Clinton administration and this administration, as a success story. When have these people been to Chicago? Please. I can't figure out how Paul Vallis keeps failing up. I mean, from, from Chicago to Philadelphia to New Orleans to Haiti, if I had that many Bridgeport. failures in my life. He's in Hartford now. Now he's in Bridgeport. Bridgeport, okay. You know. So literally, the, you know, the, the, the discourse is that Chicago is, quote, fixed. It's not fixed. It's in worse shape than ever before. So I think it really, I, don't, I just don't think education was really on the radar in this administration. 
Um, I'm also frustrated um, with the way in which, you know, as Gary alluded to, well, actually stated, that folks like Gates, Broad, TFA, KIPP have all decided they know how to do this better. Um, and there's no evidence that they do. Uh, in our own, in my state of Wisconsin, we have evidence that our voucher programs are literally worse than our public schools in terms of uh, actual performance. And what was the response? Well, we just need to expand the voucher program. I don't understand this logic. I think we are in perhaps one of the most dangerous times since the Civil War, literally, about around issues of race. Um, I also want to point out, you know, you, you gave uh, some statistic about um, likelihood of getting into college. And I wonder how many of you realize that 70 percent of African American students who are eligible based on their PSA T scores for advanced placement never take an advanced placement course. So this is not about, quote, affirmative action. This is about basic fairness at this level where the students have no access to those things that will allow them to move forward in the society. So rationing of rigor has been a long and cherished tradition. Uh, in this country. You know, you go back to rigor in the 17th century was literacy. Uh, and, you know, it was l illegal, as you noted, uh, Gloria, to, to teach a black person to read. Uh, in the 20th century, rationing of college preparatory curricula throughout the country, not just in the South, but you know, California, everywhere, rationing of that as if somehow or another this was a scarce resource that only the few. And today, uh, rationing of college preparatory uh, curricula continues. Now, so I want to switch over, therefore, to reform and, but I want to begin there with, this is reform, which is going to have the name of Barack Obama and Arne Duncan all over it. And they are to, I, I would say, you know, maybe there's probably a pretty good number of people in here who supported the, the president for reelection because of the alternative, but they have a, I would disagree with, they have a very clear and proactive and aggressive P through 16 education agenda. And Gary, it's very much reform oriented. Uh, and, you know, so let's just begin with the K through 12 part of that. Uh, common core, alternative uh, approaches to certification and coming into the profession. Uh, charter schools, now they, I don't think vouchers are in their agenda, but charter schools very much in their agenda. So, I mean, I, I, I hear the critique, but this is, ch the landscape is changing. And, and so, if the federal government is going to approach this and you think there's an alternative, what is the alternative and how, how do you, in, how do you in bring that to bear? Well, if we take these things one at a time, um, each of them has better and worse ways to do it. If we do Common Core, and there are things about Common Core that I happen to really like, which is, you know, much better to have one or two pretty good tests than 50 crummy ones <laughs> that can't be compared. Uh, much better to have uh, students focus a little more on advanced skills so that I can teach them in college rather than just um, learn how to recite things and, and drill, drill, drill on basic skills. Um, you know, there are things in Common Core that I really like. Now, there are some real dangers in Common Core being implemented stupidly. Uh, so, you know, basically, 
I believe in opportunity to learn. You should not be tested on something you haven't been instructed on. That's immoral. You should not be tested in a way that does not respect your linguistic background. One-fifth of all the kids in the United States are growing up in non-English speaking homes. Language matters a lot in this society now, and I don't think the common core of people have come to terms with how to appropriately test kids whose native language isn't English. Um, that's really important, because if we start pushing people to out because of that, because we're not thinking that through, that's a shame. And if we really use it to raise the standards without raising the capacity, and we do it too fast, we are going to be flunking more of the kids that we're talking about, the ones that are in the lowest decile schools, the ones whose families are poor, the ones who have to move all the time because they can't afford any housing. You know, all of those kids are going to be, they're disadvantaged already and they're going to be more disadvantaged. So thinking, thinking about how to do this and whether we use it for high stakes or whether we use it for diagnosis is another absolutely critical thing. As far as using it for diagnosis and finding out where our kids are on things and trying to figure out what to do next to make them more successful, I'm all in favor of that. If we're going to use it to, to retain them in grade, which means increasing their probability of dropping out of high school, if we're going to use it to, not, to deny them their high school diploma after they passed all their courses, that's wrong. Uh, that's really wrong. So thinking about how to do this is really important, and I just don't see any depth of thought on some of these issues. If you do it in a colorblind, classbind way and just assume that you can do it in every school right away uh, without any uh, uh, preparation and that the chips should just fall where they may, the chips are going to fall on the people that, that are most vulnerable, and their schools are going to be punished another time. So, so I want to probably hit these three things, uh, actually two, because I think Gary's done a great job of explaining the issue of Common Core, so I won't, I won't go over that again. But the two things that I think are um, sort of critical in this discussion of reform are the issue of teacher preparation um, versus alternative certification. I have to tell you that uh, I'm getting increasing calls from suburban districts. Uh, I was always an urban district scholar, but more suburban districts are coming because of their, their changes. Uh, and then last week I was here uh, in the area to talk to the Association of Independent Maryland Schools. So these are these schools where people pay believe it or not, $33,000 a year to go to high school. I just can't figure out what you get for 30, you know. For $33,000, you better come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what struck me, what struck me is I, I ask the question all the time when I go to these suburban districts. How many of you have come into teaching through alternative certification? Zero. So these are the teachers that are teaching, quote, our best kids. I love Jonathan Kozol's statement. If money is good for rich people, think how much better it would be for poor people. <laughs> <laughs> if certification is good for the top students, think how much better it would be for the lowest students. So this notion of constantly <laughs> raising what teachers have to do in, through the traditional teacher preparation programs, at the same moment you have a back door that says, oh, you don't have to do any of that stuff. You just, you just need a degree in, in uh, chemistry. That's crazy making. And when the people on the main line of Philadelphia, the people in Naperville, or New Trier in Illinois, when the people on Whitefish Bay in Wisconsin, when they start clamoring for Teach for America teachers, then I'm a clamor for them. <laughs> but until they think that's the teachers they should have, why are we foisting them on the least of these? We have a really funny idea in, in America that it's, this is a zero-sum game. We don't understand that when we help the least of these, you invariably help everybody. 
Case in point, no, no curb cutouts on, the, uh, and on streets. Anybody who was able-bodied didn't want that. We didn't lobby for that. But the disabled community pushed and pushed for curb cutouts. So now we have them in every city. Guess who's happy they're there? The way I travel, oh, I'm so happy pulling that roller board <laughs> past that curb cutout. That mother with the stroller, she didn't ask for a curb cutout, but guess what? Really happy. That dad who has a son who rides his bike and wants to stay off the street is really happy that his son doesn't have to jump a curb. So you did something for the least of these, but we all benefited. It's the same thing in education. It is not helping us as a society to continue to keep these kids in the outside of the workforce, outside of productive citizenship. Um, then the, the other point that reflects reform, I think, is this whole notion of, well, we'll just close the school. That is the most bizarre thing I have ever heard of in my life. I have been on six of the seven major continents. The only one I'm going to is Antarctica. If you have any friends there, tell them don't invite me. I'm not going there. <laughs> but everywhere I go, from the largest city to the smallest village, people show me two things, the place they worship and the place they go to school. When you take a school out of a community, you destroy it. You absolutely destroy it. And I can, you know, Philadelphia's my hometown. I live near Chicago, 132 miles northwest of it. The idea that, you know, you, you can look at the numbers and say, well, we don't have money for this. Whatever happened to all these smart people who thought about something like multi-use buildings? You don't have to just have a school in a building. You can rent space. You can do other things. But the idea was that these kids don't deserve it. Just, just let's close the school. Um, and at the same time in Chicago, what we're seeing is now the management companies are coming in and saying, oh, no, we'll open that school. So they're going to be KIPP schools in what used to be public schools in Chicago. And we're going to pay those people to do it when we already paid PACs tax dollars for you to do it. I think one of the conversations I had uh, with one of the co um, conferees yesterday was about the degree to which many of these superintendents are happy to let somebody else do the work. Okay, my fundamental question is if you're going to let the management company do it, why, why do we have you? <laughs> why are we paying you? How do you justify your job if you're willing to give it to somebody else? On the teacher issue, there's a central concern that I have, which is basically that the best, most experienced teachers are in the, the richest, most affluent places in our country. And the, the brand new teachers with no experience and from the not great teacher training institutions and so forth are in the schools that have double and triple segregation. Uh, they're in the schools that have tremendous turnover of students and staff and very little stability. Um, and those schools are being constantly sanctioned as failures. Um, how do we, how does our policy relate to this? I believe that one of the real tragedies of No Child Left Behind is that it made life so unpleasant for teachers in the in those schools that were struggling the most and under um, under warnings or under sanctions, that it ac accelerated the departure of, of qualified teachers and administrators, um, and and it lessened the likelihood that they'll even start a career in a school that's under those kinds of pressures, and it forced them to teach in a rigid way with no imagination and to focus only on the test. I think that that has been a tragedy. And I think that what I worry about, about the waivers and the, you know, the uh, added value added model is that it's going to do the same thing again. That your teachers are going to have a tremendous incentive to go to the places where the kids are ready, where the peer group is fast, uh, where the instruction is advanced, and where your kids are going to add a lot of value to your test scores. 
Um, you know, and that's going to be, we have to think about a set of policies that do the opposite. Let's say that if a teacher goes to a school that really, truly needs her or him, um, they're going to be respected. And what difference they make is going to be honored and rewarded. Uh, and they're going to be treated like adults. And they're going to be permitted to teach off of a narrow curriculum, an extremely narrow curriculum. And their work is going to be valued and praised. You know, we have to think about that. I and mean, what teachers and principals are doing is rational in terms of this crazy system. They're going to some place where they can survive. Um, we need to think about how to get them in the places where they can really make truly great difference. Because we know that good schools make a bigger difference for kids from really poor families with few educational resources than they do for affluent kids who almost always turn out no matter what, because they've got so many other resources in their lives and such a rich group of peers and so forth. So think about the fact that these two reforms, which are made to, meant to raise the quality of teaching, are, have a tendency to put the best teachers even more in the schools where they're the least needed and to drive them out of the schools where they're most needed. That is a terrible, terrible policy dilemma. Yeah, but we can come Gary, up with a much better solution to that. Here, I, I, and I, I want to switch and, and bring the audience into this conversation, but I'm concerned, and let me just, I know you, you, they didn't say this in the introduction. I'm on the board of Teach for America, and I'm on the board of the KIPP Foundation. I'm actively engaged in, uh, and by the way, uh, my son-in-law, who is a Teach for America alum, uh, runs a KIPP school where my grandson goes and uh, is doing, and, and it's an exceptional school in, in Atlanta. So, I mean, I, 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 I put my most precious resource into that environment. So, I mean, it's just uh, all truth and, and advertising up here. But I'm concerned that we are both... Um, there's a tendency here to reject, and perhaps on very good grounds, uh, the quote-unquote reforms, but there's also a tendency here to either sugarcoat what is the status quo or to sort of uh, create this notion that there was a time when something better was happening. We talk about who's in the classroom or who's leaving the classroom. Uh, 14% of the teachers in the lowest income schools, only 14% come from the top of their graduating class. So, I mean, that, that you, the, the, there's a, you called the teacher prep programs mediocre. Uh, so, uh, if, if, it's, if, if alternative certification isn't good, if drawing young people out of the tops of their class to participate in Teach for America and about 40% of them will remain in the profession. That's not good. Oh, oh, what, what, I mean, you want to challenge my facts, but, but what, what, is, what is good? Uh, what is the better approach? Let, let me jump in here because I think one of the places where we often get bogged down is we're trying to fix something way up here that we didn't fix way down here. I mentioned this to Gary coming in. There are two bottom line issues for me that we have never addressed. One is we never fully desegregated these schools. Never. Never. We never did that. Secondly, we never funded them equally. So those are the two bottom line issues for me. Please don't talk to me about the curriculum and all these other pieces until we say we're going to follow the law of the land. And we do have law on these things. Of course, they get, they get rolled back. So, those are fundamental rights, mm -hmm. and there's rights is the third part of this, right. that we have not addressed. So yeah, you end up having these, these things on the other end. And I will say, uh, as a teacher educator, on my campus, the lion's share of people who end up going to Teach for America, if you talk to them about why they went, their excuse on my campus, I can't say for all these other campuses, is I could not get into the University of Wisconsin teacher ed program because the qualifications were too high and they, I got rejected from them. So while it may not be true in other places, many of our 
uh, folks who, who take an alternative route, we didn't accept them in our program. And I, and I don't want to be an apologist for bad programming. There are some bad teacher ed programs out here. We have to acknowledge that. I've had lots of Teach for America students in graduate school at Harvard and at UCLA. Um, and a lot of them are wonderful people. I mean, they really are dedicated. I have undergraduate students going in to Teach for America. Um, uh, they really are earnest. They work hard. They get put in god-awful schools lots of times. Um, they just don't know what to do. I mean, they have almost no preparation. And almost all of them that come to talk to me about it say, you know, now I want to learn how to do it. I, was, I suffered in this school. I, I did my best. I don't think I did too much harm because I was working 18 hours a day. Um, but I really didn't know what to do. Um, and I want to learn because I really do care about the kids that I got to know. Uh, and I think in terms of Teach for America, the best thing that's coming out of it is some people who decide to become really serious educators um, because they've been there and they've seen and they know and they know what the need is and they do care and they understand that a few weeks of preparation really didn't leave them prepared to do what the kids needed for them. Um, so I don't look down on those folks. They, they're people who care, they they're people who try and if they stay in the field, there are people who decide they need to learn somehow. I think they need to learn much better than go to some road academy or something like that, because I think that's a very superficial kind of training. But um, you know, we should try to draw, draw those people seriously into the education profession, the, the ones who really are motivated and smart and care and realize that uh, they need to learn something from master teachers and so forth. Uh, uh, the practical problem about teacher quality is that we have really not pro produced a good career model for, student, for teachers to go to and stay in really disadvantaged schools. And we are not doing anything to disestablish that extremely intense segregation by race and poverty and sometimes language. Um, we know from we, from, we did this national survey of teachers from the NEA membership list. And what, one of the things we found was um, teachers leave schools as they resegregate. Uh, they're leaving suburban schools as they resegregate. Um, teachers like stably integrated schools. They stay there. They really like them very positively. Why don't we try to create more of those? Most of our suburban rings are going through big changes now. Is anybody in your area trying to figure out how to remain successfully diverse by race and class? Those are good schools to teach in. They're good schools for children. They actually prepare you for the future of the society. Um, why don't we have a policy to try to make, support those schools and to try to keep them? Most of the black and Latino families in most of our metros now who are middle class don't live in the city anymore. They live in the suburbs but they're being resegregated in the suburbs. You know, but they're being resegregated and it's just, uh, it's yeah. by not, because, because as black people move and Latinos move into those communities, white people move out. That's because we have absolutely no policy to stabilize those communities. Nothing is being done for them. And there is massive real estate steering going on, partly using test score data. We have to ad address those issues if we're going to keep uh, community stable because when we do as you know I lived in Hyde Park for years I lived in in Central Square in Cambridge I lived in, um, in Capitol Hill here in Washington where all my kids started school in the DC public schools those are healthy vigorous neighborhoods where everybody wants to live we have had almost no work on making more of those or pretend or or, or helping the suburbs not resegregate we just published a book Harvard Ed Press um, uh, resegregation of suburban schools. Look at it. It'll tell you some important things to think about. Um, you know, we can, we have to figure out how to make really disadvantaged schools a tolerable and acceptable places where teachers are supported and given a chance to do something good without being hit by asinine policies. Um, you know, a lot of teachers would like to if they were given uh, support and rewarded for the difference that they make.
Well, you do have an opportunity right here in the district because whites are moving back into the city. And, you know, the, the big storyline here today is uh, the reintegration of these schools. Now, the question is whether they'll balkanize all over again. I was in Denver the uh, day before yesterday, and, you, and the superintendent is... Uh, uh, you know, bragging about the numbers of uh, middle-class families that are moving back into central to to central Denver, but will they just balkanize into those neighborhoods where they are the majority? Well, it, my kids all started in the D.C. schools, and I know the D.C. schools. You know, they're they're D.C. is no longer majority black. It's gentrified as a city, um, but it hasn't reflected in the public schools or the charter schools. And the whole new set of charter schools has been created uh, with under a lot of pressure from Congress, uh, the White House and so forth. They're even more segregated than the public schools. We've just been looking at New York City where the public schools are about nine tenths non-white. The charter schools are virtually 100% segregated. Um, you know, why don't we try to do something about gentrification that's positive? Why don't we try to w draw both groups of kids back into the same schools? You can't do it without having a plan to do it, and telling people that you want to do it, supporting those neighborhoods and drawing them in. Right now, we, we have gentrifying neighborhoods full of uh, what they call dinks, double income, no kids. We have the uh, uh, gay, we have the empty nesters. We don't have the families raising their children because we haven't thought through how to do the school part right. Um, it takes some brains to do that, um, but it can be done. It's a really good place for really good magnet schools, public magnet schools that have an integrated goal and that speak to both sides of these communities and draw them into public schools. We're just not putting our imagination into these kinds of possibilities. They exist, but we're not realizing them. And some of the things we're doing are just making a bad situation worse. And I think Gary's point about um, good quality magnet schools, in most major cities, such a school exists. And white people will take buses, subways, and trains to get to them. Nobody has problems going to Bronx Science. They don't care that it's in the Bronx. It's Bronx Science. People come in to Whitney Young uh, in uh, Chicago. People still go to Central High School in Philadelphia or Lowell High School in San Francisco because they know that these are schools that set their kids on the road to high quality post-secondary experiences. So we have these little models. Um, it's, it's not just a pipe dream, but we have not thought about how do we expand those ideas and as Gary said, how do we create the sort of stability that all families are looking for, not just white families. All families are looking for places where teachers stay, where administration is stable, and where they can be uh, fairly well assured that their students will get uh, a high quality education experience. So we have a little more than 10 minutes left and questions from the, uh, from the audience. So this gentleman right here. You, with beard. <laughs> There's lots of beards. <laughs> well, all right. Wrong you with the beard. OK, oh, well. go ahead. All right. Uh, yes, um, it seems to me that, and I really appreciate the work that's been done to expand gaps from achievement gaps to whether we talk about education debt or opportunity gaps and so forth. But I think that there's a step further that we need to go than to just look at deficits. What kids don't have or aren't bringing. If we define our solution by only the gaps we see versus the strengths that we want to nurture and desire, we will have not defined our solution well. And I, I would talk about a little bit and hear what you have to say about how our 30 years with reform since a nation at risk. And by the way, when does something that's been done for 30 years become status quo? <laughs> it's not been successful. The reform market-based style is the status quo when for 30 years has not worked. All right, so is there a question so here? So the question is, how do we get a strengths-based capacity uh, 
kind of approach to school where we literally are having more empowering, engaging kinds of teaching and learning going on than ones that just get shown on test scores, which is a merit-based system. How can we use that as our way forward to be seeing our children as having strengths to nurture and develop and giving them the life-giving experiences to develop all those rich capacities, not just to improve on a test. All right, thank you. Gloria? Well, I would say, you know, we, we don't want to fall into the trap of either or dichotomous thinking. But on the same, yeah, on the, from the, on the same plane that we need, quote, preventative medicine, you can't just do preventative medicine when people come in with diabetes. You, you, you've got to treat that. So it is a both and approach that we have to deal with. The, the crisis in urban communities is real. It's real. And I know probably better than most that these kids have incredible strengths. They have resilience. But the reality is they are in deep poverty. They have teachers who are less than well prepared to teach them. They are in under-resourced schools. So despite their assets, despite their strengths, they are fighting real structural ba uh, barriers. We got to deal with both of these things. I, let me say something about this. Um, um, my, my firm belief is that in every neighborhood there's a kid who could go to any school in the world that has the genius, the talent, and so forth, it doesn't have the opportunity. It doesn't, never comes to a situation where he takes a grade level class with, uh, with a challenging teacher that enables him to turn on. Um, when we did the city suburban exchanges in Chicago in the, with public housing, there were kids who were getting F's in the city who got A's in the suburbs because they were so bored and they were so frustrated. Um, so we have those kids. Uh, we don't have a system that identifies and develops their talent, and that's a shame. And there are a lot of positive things about kids. We have 20% of our kids know another language fluently. That's not a deficit, that's an asset. We're a country, <laughs> you know, we're a country that is monolingual in a world that we don't compete in very well. Can't we figure out how to use that asset? as an asset on, with the dual immersion language schools and things like that, where we enrich the experience of the English speakers and we, we treat the kids who speak Spanish or Chinese as really big assets, because they are, if they're used properly. Uh, why don't we think about things like that? Another thing, a pet peeve that I have is, you know, I lived in Chicago for a long time. Chicago was a tremendous formative influence of jazz. It was a huge place where gospel emerged as music. Um, it was a place of tremendous creativity, and the creativity was in the inner city. It wasn't in the suburbs. And we take those arts, those things that really motivate kids, the creativity, and we take it out of the schools altogether, and we just drill them constantly. That's a sin against our culture, and that's a sin against those kids. It's telling them that something that they know doesn't exist and doesn't matter. One of my daughters taught in an inner city school in Boston. And she said, Dad, these kids say they can't remember anything, but they know 300 raps. <laughs> and, you know, as soon as something's on the radio, they've memorized it. Can't we figure out how to use that? That's a talent. Can't we, can't we figure out how to cross those lines and use that capacity? Um, Gary, this is a perfect setup for me. Perfect. <laughs> So she's going to another. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a kid from Milwaukee no, but who that's... has combined. It's two minutes. Who has combined? But we only have five. Who has combined uh, science and the, that artistic ability? He asked a question about assets. I tried. <laughs> I'll, I'll never get on a panel. This wasn't rehearsed. <laughs>
are ovens with windows. And as the knob on global warming increases, lives are preheated until a soul souffles. Pancake stack projects are poured over with a humid as thick as molasses. Heat and humidity are the perfect appetizer on death's plate. It's an all-you-can-heat buffet from May to October and senior citizen discount is every day. If thermometers can measure temperatures, they should be able to measure human anxiety. As the temperature rises, we reach boiling points. Attitudes of those around us rise quicker than mercury, and the pressure of staying cool causes us to explode. Compressed living complexes circulate heat and cause compressed feelings to converge upon our neighbors in the hood. So that 90% release of excess body heat talked about in science class is contributed to our local temperature rising. We crack open fire hydrants until we hear lights crying, raising taxes by lowering our body temperature. And if you couldn't afford a wind replacer, fridges and freezers were propped open until your two brothers' faces are frozen. Audiences applaud the ice cream man once that familiar jingle mingles with our ears. This sweet release of flooded heat is a godsend. But what do you know? The ice cream vendor's name is Noah. As the temperature rises, so do attitudes, death rates, bills, and ice cream stocks. Heat affects the elderly more than it does us. Their lungs resemble the Dow Exchange. Rises and drops until they crash. Ambulances are summoned. Riding down the street flooded with the contents of the only fire hydrant. We have only just begun to fry. And I just want to tell you the upside to that story. We offered that kid a scholarship and at the University of Wisconsin, and he is an environmental studies major. It was his art, his understanding, and the melding of the art with science that we said that's the kind of kid we're looking for. All right, we've heard, so Harriet says, three or four more questions. Yes, right here. I'm here as a hybrid educator. I've been a public school teacher and a college teacher most of my life, but the last 13 years I've been an adult educator. When we look at the numbers of dropouts, I waited in 2012 during uh, Barack Obama's State of the Union speech, I waited for him to talk about adult education. He was a community organizer in Chicago. He had to have worked with a lot of the dropouts. What are we doing about them when they do drop out? They, they still need everything that we've talked about here today. Yeah. We did a book called Dropouts in America. Some of you might be interested in it. And we held a national conference up until the the early 2000s, almost all of the dropout statistics in the United States were fraudulent. They dramatically underestimated the number of dropouts. We now kind of know how big it is and we know where they are. They're in about 2,000 high schools in the United States. Um, um, uh, Professor Balfant at Johns Hopkins has identified them as the dropout factories of the country. They're almost all segregated high poverty urban schools, except for some schools in the rural south. Um, they are one of the costs of the tremendous isolation we have for these kids. And we really don't, once the kid drop out, drops out, we don't do much about it. People don't know there was a title in No Child Left Behind about dropouts. It was because of some of the studies we did in the early 2000s. We were involved in helping write the dropout accountability into, to, into No Child Left Behind. It was gutted by the Bush administration. They did nothing about it. They asked for a zero appropriation for the dropout title. There is no significant funding for adult education or for dropout prevention. There's a lot of kids who are close enough to graduating who could graduate. If they don't drop, once they leave school, bringing them back is extremely hard. Now what we're doing is we're raising the standards on the GED so that it becomes harder to pass. I just think that we've neglected. We've written off people who drop out or are on the path to drop out. And we can tell who's on the path to drop out in ninth grade. 
We need massive ninth grade interventions. We need summer tutoring programs. We need credit recovery programs. And we need a, last, a second chance. We need education programs in jail, since we're sending so many of our kids to jail. This, and we need, and we, need we need federal funding for students who are in jail exactly, to get education. Exactly. I mean, what are these kids supposed to do when they come out of jail? Um, they can't be employed, really. There's no full-time employment for them. There's no welfare for young men. If you have no job and you have no income um, and there's no welfare program for you, you're going to live off as a predator. You know, you don't have any real choice. We have to have a different choice, a better choice than that. And we have to support it seriously. It's unconscionable, the, the number of losses that we're taking, especially in young men of color across this country. I, that, I'd add one point to that, and that is that if you add to people who haven't completed, the people who haven't completed college, who have some college and haven't completed, it's about 35 million Americans. Uh, who fall in that category. And so that this issue of adult education is really broader than high school dropouts. I mean, we have people whose lives would be materially changed if we had policies which drove more of them to pursue education. And, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that that's a very large adult population which is utterly underserved right now. I saw a question. Uh, I, hand we have a. We have yeah. a question back here already yeah. with the mic. Yeah, who um, Two questions. Do you believe there's a policy role for differentiated pay in attracting teachers to the most challenging schools? And secondly, does having a teacher of color matter for the achievement of minority students? That's two very different questions. All right, so. I, I'll speak to the second one. You want to take the first one? Okay. I think that we don't have conclusive evidence that differential pay makes a big difference, but I do feel that teachers who are making a difference in really disadvantaged schools should get something expert, extra. And teachers who can make the language differences into an asset also, I think, are teachers who are uh, very important in this time. Um, I know that this is a problem in any union, um, but um, I think it's something that's worth thinking about. I don't expect it's going to make a huge difference. There's a conservative economist who's kind of run the numbers down in Texas, and he says he thinks it would take at least $25,000 a year to keep uh, really good teachers in very disadvantaged schools. Nobody's talking about any incentive like that. But I think some recognitions and some rewards, both financial and, and just plain rewards and recognition in the community of of the profession are important for teachers who take on extraordinary jobs and stick with them. Gloria? And I want to take on the question of teachers of color for students of color. Uh, I would argue that all students, regardless of their race or ethnicity, need to see a teaching force that more accurately reflects the country. <laughs> students who are in most danger of not being able to deal with the human relations issues that we confront as adults are white students who have only seen white people in authority and white people as um, their teachers. We see it all the time at the university. We have a large number of international scholars who teach, particularly in our STEM fields, and the, the resistance to our scholars from Korea or uh, the, the Arab world or all parts of Asia is just unconscionable because these students have not been in classrooms where people who are look different than they are are in authority. So yes, it, it, it would be helpful for students of color, but it'd be even better for, for all students to have a more diverse workforce. Final question right here. Wow, the pressure's on. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> Julian Vasquez, Hyla UT Austin. Uh, first, want to say that this, uh, our, this new rising uh, next generation of academics were, of course, very inspired by Gloria and, and, and Gary. My question is about what do we do when the data doesn't actually line up with the ideology? So, for example, my own peer reviewed research on KIPP uh, in Texas shows that 40% of African Americans leave KIPP 
uh, over the last decade. Uh, that's looking at the Texas data. It's publicly available. You can look at that, and I've, I've addressed that with Mike Feinberg. Or how about the fact that the Mathematica study shows an effect of 0.07, which is seven hundredths of a standard deviation for Teach for America. When we have other uh, interventions, if you look at meta-analysis, even uh, Hannah Schecht's most conservative meta-analysis of class size reduction shows a 0.20 effect, which is 200% more effect than Teach for America. If you look at, um, uh, uh, say, pre-K, there's 1,412% more effect <laughs> relative to Teach for America. So how do we get that message out that sometimes data doesn't align with the, ideolo the current ideology? So I know Gary's gonna give you the... I know Gary's going to give you the scholarly response. I'm going to give you the on the ground response. If data changed people's mind, Al Gore would have been the president. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. The inf information I quoted about Milwaukee's voucher program. We had splashed over every newspaper in the state saying this program is not more effective than what they consider to be its worst school system, MPS. It's not more effective. And yet the governor had no problem pushing forward the expansion of the program. I wish data mattered in this way. It matters to us, but it doesn't seem to matter to the powers that be. Gary? Yeah, I think that one of the most amazing things is, is we've been doing the same basic kind of high stakes assessment reform for 30 years. It clearly has not worked. You know, both of the, the uh, Goals 2000 and the uh, NCLB both ended in disaster without meeting any of their objectives. And so what people are saying is, let's do more of that stuff. <laughs> When liberal policies come, you know, policies like integration, for example, if it doesn't solve all the problems within a year or two, they say, that failed. We tried that and that failed. But if it's a policy that's kind of ideologically backed, they just say, well, if it didn't work, let's do it for another 30 years. Let's do it deeper. <laughs> um, but data does matter sometimes. And I think preschool is a good example. Preschool is partly on the agenda now across the country because James Heckman, a Nobel winner uh, in economics at the University of Chicago, has come up with some very good data that says high quality preschool can change your life. Um, and people are listening to that. Um, and uh, data can be very important in a situation like that, especially if it's that uh, powerful and done from that powerful a position. I think that's one of the reasons we are talking really seriously about preschool and we're talking about preschool at a higher quality, more professional level. Um, and I think we will have more preschool at a better level as part of our future um, because it's something that doesn't have a real ideological dimension. It just makes pure sense. And it, there is data to back it up and the fact that there is data is helping persuade legislatures around the country to put some money behind that data. So let's give this great panel a hand. <laughs>